the 21st of January 2021 is significant for it marks 100 years of humanities and social sciences education in Sri Lanka. From its inception, the University of Colombo has played an integral role in making higher education accessible to all and has been a pioneer in teaching and research in the arts and sciences. Over the last few decades, the University of Colombo has been known for the quality of its teaching and for its involvement in the community as part of the very fabric of the city. This unique occasion in the university's lifetime not only presents an opportunity to celebrate the university's achievements and journey over the past 100 years, but is also a time to envision the bright future that lies ahead. On this day, we commemorate the academic success and proud achievements of our distinguished staff, students and alumni. The University of Colombo emerged in a century of exceptional change and the history of the university dates back to the early 20th century when the Ceylon University College was formally declared open on the 21st of January 1921. In this time, Robert Mars was appointed as the principal of the college and he was succeeded by Sir Ivor Jennings who served as the first Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ceylon. At this early stage in 1921, students prepared for the external degree examinations of the University of London and the first lectures in the Arts and Sciences were held at the College House. During the period between 1921 and 1935, a total of 337 students of the Ceylon University College graduated from the University of London. In April 1942, the State Council established the University of Ceylon by amalgamating the Ceylon Medical College and the Ceylon University College. In the early 1950s, the University of Ceylon shifted to Peradeliya and by this time had established a reputation as a centre of excellence in the Commonwealth. The University of Colombo, as we know it today, became an independent university under the University's Act of 1978. The university now has nine faculties, seven institutes and 18 centres and units. The Faculty of Arts, the largest faculty of the University of Colombo, is made up of 11 academic departments and 5 units offering both undergraduate and postgraduate degree programs that include studies and research in the humanities and social sciences. In 1963, a new arts faculty was established in Colombo as part of the University of Ceylon which continues to function as the current faculty. The faculty marked two milestones in its academic history when it introduced the course unit system in 1998 and the study streams in 2015. The course unit system offered students greater flexibility in selecting courses from a wide range of subjects that are interdisciplinary in nature. The Faculty of Arts caters to very local and foreign students and is equipped with modern resource centers and libraries that house books, journals and student manuals that are relevant to each discipline. There are several well-equipped laboratories, a language lab as well as self-access center which provides an autonomous learning environment for students to improve their language skills at their own pace. The faculty computer labs also provide opportunities for computer-based learning. The introduction of the learning management system or LMS and the adoption of LearnZoom which provides conference and lecture facilities to students and staff free of charge, the faculty was able to persevere in academic excellence amongst the prevailing COVID-19 pandemic. Such conferences organized by the faculty contribute to knowledge dissemination at both local and international levels and enable knowledge enhancement of the community at large. A forum for research presentation is hosted annually through the International Research Conference of the Faculty of Arts, known as Icon Arts. In 2019, the faculty introduced the annual undergraduate research symposium which has enabled students to showcase their research findings to larger audience from within and outside the faculty. Proud of its vision to be a center of excellence in creative thinking, teaching, research and community outreach in the South Asian region, the Faculty of Arts strives to achieve its mission by promoting collective scholarship, critical inquiry, competencies and skills in the social sciences and humanities in keeping with the highest academic and ethical standards in teaching, research, training and evaluation. <laughs> In our centenary year, we 
we celebrate the pioneers who have sought to create a better society and a better world through scholarship and research. We celebrate the people who have dedicated their professional lives to the University and the Faculty of Arts. The University of Colombo, as the oldest university of Sri Lanka, continues to maintain academic excellence. Faithful to its motto, Wisdom Enlightens, the university maintains its legacy of being a nourishing sanctuary to academic minds in pursuit of wisdom. We celebrate 100 years of an institution that has served the state and its people with great dedication and being an enduring symbol of excellence in humanities and social sciences education in Sri Lanka.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, are you able to hear me? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhayavikuma, for the introduction. It is always a pleasure to return to where I began my work as an academic. Thank you so much to the Faculty of Arts for this invitation to talk about teaching, learning, and learning during COVID-19 challenges and opportunities. The pandemic. COVID-19 was first identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. Despite early efforts to control the spread of the virus, on March 11, 2020, the novel infectious disease was found in 114 countries and was classified as a pandemic. Led by guidance from scientists and health officials, Governments around the world mandated national lockdowns and placed restrictions on the gathering of people to slow the spread of the virus. Daily life was fueled with uncertainty, stress, and anxiety for many as the disease advanced to urban and rural communities around the globe. For all but workers deemed as essential, business and industry shutdowns led to a surge of employees working from home. By mid to late, March 2020, most institutions of higher education and many school systems in the United States and across the globe switched to learning from face-to-face -to, -face to a remote delivery format to ensure the safety of the community in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. At some institutions, faculty were given just a few hours notice. At other institutions, they had a few weeks to prepare to move all instruction remotely. This sudden remote teaching is, however, different from actual planned online teaching. With teaching staff being, what teaching staff were being asked to do was not typical online teaching, but online triage. The sudden pivot to online teaching due to the pandemic was primarily a method to ensure the continuity of education during the global lockdown. The term now used to describe what we did emergency remote teaching. I will return to discuss online teaching, but let us first consider this abrupt transition to, that created unprecedented challenges and opportunities for educators and learners who were forced to adjust to remote teaching and learning with little to no time to prepare. To date, publicly available research on the topic the experiences, the impact, and lingering effects are almost exclusively based on survey methodologies, and in some cases, very specific to a particular co learning context. However, in reviewing this literature, the commonalities speak to our shared experiences. Educators across the globe relied on a variety of virtual environments for both presenting content and creating classrooms. These virtual environments included learning management systems such as Canvas, WebCT, Vista, Blackboard, and Moodle, video conferencing technologies like Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, GoToMeeting, and WhatsApp, and for doing collaborative work, Google Docs, Mind Maps, Padlet, and among many other digital uh, tools. A recent study by the Asian Development Bank found in Sri Lanka's higher education uh, context that Zoom and the learning management system Moodle and YouTube were the main technology platforms used for learning online. And social media tools such as WhatsApp, Facebook, and Viber, as well as email were used to support online learning. One myth I would like to dispel before we continue is the claim that nations, powerful technological infrastructures, and higher education systems with resources survived the pandemic and continue to provide higher education. While Nations with underdeveloped technological infrastructure and higher education systems with poor technological capabilities could not impart education. 
thus creating a disparity in higher education provision among these nations. Yes, there is evidence that around 28% of African countries provided higher education through radio and television because of limited technology. But in Japan, a country often associated with technological advancement was also a country that severely lags behind most developed countries when it comes to technology enhanced learning, and more specifically, formal online education. Clearly there are infrastructure and technological differences worldwide, but we have to agree that the sudden move to teaching caught on to teaching online caught all of us off guard. While many of us made the sudden pivot, early studies suggest that both faculty and students experienced unique hardships due to the swift transition to virtual learning and online classes. The most salient finding was the internet connectivity and hardware and software issues that interrupted students' ability to participate in their classes. The shift to on emergency online learning had a distinctive impact on particular subgroups of students. In the US, the severity of challenges experienced while learning digitally varied by race and income. For instance, Hispanic students reported the highest number of challenges after the transition compared to the other race and ethnicity groups. And issues with technology were more problematic for low income students than their counterparts. Higher education institutions in Sri Lanka also delivered education services online at the onset of the pandemic. This quick transition from traditional face-to-face -face teaching to online was challenging. Access to digital devices, the internet, conducting practical sessions, and examinations were the major challenges in online higher education, among other things. Uh, the Asian Development Bank brief on Sri Lanka reports national statistics in 2020. Only 22% of the general population aged 5 to 69 used desktops or laptops to connect to the internet, while 75% use smartphones. Students in higher education institutions are in a slightly better situation than the general population, but access to online higher education is challenging for many students, especially for those from low-income households. According to Yang and others in their study of Sri Lanka's university closure, their survey of university students found that 71% highlighted the poor internet connection at home as one of the major difficulties to learning at their own pace and one which affected their engagement in online learning, such as failing to attend real-time online classes or to take the examinations online. This is a map that shows students' experience with internet connectivity across Sri Lanka during the pandemic. Almost 40 to 60% of students reported poor internet connection in the orange, red, and dark red areas that cover most of the island. A study by Ramiz Fauzer and Lumna that surveyed students at Southeastern University of Sri Lanka presents similar findings with internet connection. The digital divide, without a doubt, has broadened inequalities concerning educational opportunities for students and was the key concern voiced by teachers across the globe. Many teachers also perceived their students' obstacles were balancing home, education, and their mental health. For some students, the health and economic shocks that resulted from COVID-19 led to decreased study hours and academic performance, increased withdrawals from courses, and or delayed graduation plans. Faculty members also faced numerous stumbling blocks and had to make continual adjustments to their practices accordingly. Challenges and concerns created by quickly moving instruction online affected every part of their responsibilities as instructors and researchers. The challenges included adjusting their pedagogy for the online context, keeping students motivated and engaged, administering secure exams, selecting quality online resources, and providing additional support and remediation. Faculty were primarily responsible for guiding themselves through the swift transition to online instruction. This thrust additional taxing demands on faculty. Almost without exception, faculty reported that their job responsibilities increased in volume 
and scope during the period of online teaching. Even though faculty members were faced with an array of impediments, low levels of preparedness, and institutions often lacking the resources needed to facilitate rapid faculty training, many rose to the occasion, and some teachers report positive experiences. Faculty used a combination of synchronous and asynchronous teaching models depending on educational technologies, as well as technical support found at their institutions. In spite of daunting hurdles, we all garnered some new perspectives from this experience. <clears throat> uh, let us also consider what else happened. Remote teaching and practice fundamentally changed the number of disciplines. Uh, all right. Yes, certainly, certainly. All right. Um, let me see if I can get this. Yes. Is that better? Are you able to hear me? Okay. All right. What else happened? Remote teaching and practice fundamentally changed a number of disciplines and disciplinary norms, but none more so than studio-based art and performance courses, STEM subjects that require labs and medicine and dentistry programs that include practical and clinical components. Studio and studio pedagogy are central to art and design education. The studio is a shared physical space in which students and teachers engage socially to, uh, through creative practice. So this loss of access to a physical studio space can also be described in relation to students' limited abilities to see processes. For example, the application of paint is not something you can easily learn online. There's a tactile element to painting. Also, students are unable to see others' work, the differences in perceived quality, approach, and creativity. The Journal of Chemical Education published a special issue on insights gained while teaching chemistry in the time of COVID-19. Manuscripts submitted from the chemistry education community for this special issue include authors in 31 countries and in 38 states in the US. They found that indeed the issue of laboratory learning, difficulties and downsides was the main topic more often than any other component of learning chemistry. Despite the challenges, chemistry educators developed several virtual laboratories such as O-Labs and Chem Collective, and these were used to provide laboratory experiences to learners up to a certain level. In fact, at the Open University of Sri Lanka, a virtual chemistry lab space, BCLS, was developed to provide a virtual experience in preparing for, performing, and analyzing chemical laboratory activities via computer-based simulation. The BCLS was hosted in the university learning management system and administered among learners enrolled in chemistry courses. Similarly, the provision of medical education is uniquely challenging in that there is a need for vocational exposure in clinical settings, which can't be sufficiently replaced remotely. On March 17, 2020, the Association of American Medical Colleges called for a suspension of activities that involve students interacting with patients, effectively putting clinical rotations on hold. Clinical placements at many medical schools had to be postponed during COVID-19 or limited them to some form of virtual rotation. In Sri Lanka, Chandrasiri and Virakon, who surveyed allied health sciences undergraduates at the University of Peradinia, these are students of medical lab science, nursing, pharmacy, physiotherapy and radiography and radiotherapy, found that more than half the respondents said they had difficulties in learning practical and uh, clinical-based subjects. Bamini Watta and others surveyed 644 final year medical students from eight medical uh, colleges who took their final exam and asked their perception on the impact of the pandemic on psychiatric training, 
and found that the pandemic significantly affected the training, particularly the clinical components. Kosgalan and others who surveyed preclinical uh, medical students at the University of Pera Denia about online anatomy education during COVID-19 found that almost 58% feared the lack of direct anatomy learning might have an impact on their clinical skills in the future. Similarly, Ranavira Samarnayak and Cabral's study of the virtual anatomy course for RUA the medical students concluded that whilst they were satisfied with online lectures, they preferred the in-person anatomy and histology practicals in developing their medical skills. Pandemic learning highlighted the importance of innovation in medical education. In fact, some experts in medical education are proposing the development of multimodal training strategies. When in-person clinical work is not an option, developing a virtual curriculum can be an effective alternative. Even though the physical examination is not possible during virtual rotations, medical students can be asked to observe and evaluate different maneuvers elicited by the attending physician. This is exactly what happened at Imperial College London during the pandemic. They significantly adapted their clinical programs and medical students were given access to an online bank of patient interviews and interactive cases to supplement clinical study. Furthermore, the use of specially adapted headsets worn by clinicians to give students a first-person view of patient examinations was piloted to allow large-scale bedside teaching without overcrowding clinical areas. Another potential solution they are considering is the use of telemedicine to allow direct patient interaction via video conferencing, telephone interviews, as has been used at the famous Mayo Clinic to facilitate teaching. Online academic misconduct is another major concern that universities had to deal with during the pandemic. Being online increased the potential of cheating since the instructors have little control over the virtual learning environment. Uncertainty, concern, and apprehension were faced by educators during the pandemic in conducting benchmark examinations, primarily of academic integrity and student assessment when students are not physically in the classroom. Gamage De Silva and Gunawardena's report of online delivery of assessment during COVID-19 found that many universities resorted to alternative forms of student assessments. Among the types of uh, practical assessments that were moved to online assessments were lab-based practicals, performance-based assessments, psychomotor skills, physical artifact development, interpersonal skills, and language skills. The suggested alternatives for these practical assessments include video-based uploads using cloud technology, online simulation-based tasks, submitting online portfolios, and real-time observed practicals and vivas via Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate. On a positive note, Imperial College London, again, was a world leader in how they conducted benchmark examinations. They carried out completely remote online medical examinations, which students completed under timed conditions at home. These written exams were carried out using an open book examination approach. In terms of test security, Imperial College London reported that students' responses to questions required nuanced synthesis of information and thus answers couldn't simply be searched on the internet. An additional safeguard was randomizing test questions for each student, rendering collusion between students ineffective. Furthermore, because exams were time pressured, there simply was not enough time to intensively research relevant information. Securing integrity in digital examinations is conceptually different or to traditional approaches, with research indicating that categories of academic misconduct and their definitions need to be reconsidered for the digital age. If we move towards normalizing online examinations and assessments post-pandemic, we must develop a culture of academic integrity around digital assessment. 
Although it is too early to get a comprehensive understanding of the impact that the pandemic has had on teaching and learning, this initial research on emergency remote teaching during the global pandemic shed some light into teachers' and students' experiences. Before considering the lessons we have learned, or if the lessons are even worth keeping, let us go back to online learning. The physical separation of the learner from other learners and from the instructor in a class or course that consists in a virtual space. While no delivery format is inherently superior to another, we know online education has affordances that, other, uh, that are different from face-to-face -face courses. Online education is flexible, can be adaptive, allows for enhanced individualized and authentic materials, can take advantage of communicative tasks and interaction, and can foster and take advantage of autonomous learning. Most notably, we know by removing temporal and geographical obstacles, online education can reach a broader audience than face-to-face -face courses. On the other hand, a community atmosphere and personal connections have to be carefully crafted in online environments where gestures, body language, a common physical experience, and often even facial expressions are missing. Of course, stakeholders' technology literacy, access, and infrastructure may greatly impact what is possible. There are a few key areas where a plan online versus a forced rapid switch to remote instruction have pronounced and consequential differences. First and foremost, online instruction is designed for learning in a virtual space. The accompanying technology and tools are then carefully selected for the educational objectives. Furthermore, faculty receive professional development and support to succeed in this modality. High quality digital learning experiences rely on instructional design principles and strategies to align learning outcomes with learning assignments activities and assessments. Moreover, through integrating intentional opportunities for community building and interaction in the digital environment, these experiences are well organized and thoughtfully designed. Finally, planned online education has intentional commitment and buy-in from most stakeholders, carefully vetted resources, faculty training, and collaborations between subject matter experts and instructional designers and technology specialists from the beginning. Planned online teaching also has long-term outlook implemented in multiple iterations using proven evaluation frameworks and is designed for sustainability. The Sri Lankan education system has predominantly relied on a traditional face-to-face -face teaching environment with the limited attention on e-learning avenues. Most commonly found in Sri Lankan higher education context is the blended learn is blended learning, combining traditional face-to-face -face classrooms and online educational materials in order to enhance teaching and learning. Despite the limited attention to e-learning strategies or the slow acceptability of e-learning platforms, Sri Lanka was able to move instruction online during the COVID-19 shutdown. You could say this was part in part due to government programs already in place. In 2017, the Sri Lankan government took an initiative towards technology-based education through the Higher Education for 21st Century Project. Under this project, most state universities in Sri Lanka adopted technology and implemented e-learning platforms to perform several functionalities such as planning and scheduling of courses, teacher student evaluation, communicating with students, etc. Digital transformation was already a priority with plans to support students and faculty with free internet via university web servers under a 2019 national policy framework called Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor. The pandemic forced students to learn online and while the challenges, access to digital devices, stable internet remain, especially for students from low-income households, the pandemic has laid a strong foundation toward blended learning for post-pandemic higher education in, in the country. Moving forward, Sri Lanka should aim to transition its digital higher education into the next stage, 
such as accreditation of online courses and development of curriculum and pedagogy for blended learning by following best practices that have been established in online higher education. In times of pandemic, war, crisis, natural disaster, or extreme weather, online education may be the only option. So what lessons did higher education institutions learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? Are the lessons worth keeping? What gains were made? And how can higher education harness and improve on those gains? <coughs> Excuse me. Emergency remote learning resulted in a boost to online teaching and learning. It also fast forwarded the adoption of more broad-based online learning strategies and technologies and demonstrated resilience. We can list some favorable consequences of this experience. Institutions have grown their catalogs of online courses. Faculty, perhaps to their surprise, have learned that they can develop and engage in virtual classrooms. Faculty members learn new technology skills. Faculty and students who have had not previously considered online learning as an option now have had a taste of it. Institutions with a minimal footprint in the online environment deployed large numbers of emergency remote courses almost simultaneously demonstrating the potential for scalability in the online learning mode. So the post-COVID uh, period could be a time for higher education to create a plan for effective online learning, particularly by institutions that had lagged behind. It will be a period to develop policies and procedures for online learning to assess and determine best technologies and deliver methods for online learning courses to assemble the right online learning team, which include instructional design experts for course development and improvement, and to prepare faculty in course development and online teaching. <clears throat> we have to remember that the pandemic also revealed the digital, the, the digital divide, which remains a significant issue around the globe. So not all learn to love online learning, but institutions should anticipate a continuing need in this mode of instruction and find ways to support students and faculty who opt for online learning because of its flexibility and other benefits. Another favorable consideration is to treat the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity for reimagining education. Schools, colleges, academies, universities are institutions for education, but they were built at a time when human understanding of learning and learners knowledge and skills, as well as teaching and teachers is different from today. The COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to be a once in a generational opportunity for real change for a number of reasons. First, the pandemic was global and affected virtually all educational institutions. As such, it provides the opportunity for educators and learners to come together to rethink the education we actually need as opposed to an inflexible, outdated model that we are likely to feverishly cling to. Second, educators across the world demonstrated that they could, be, could collectively change en masse and carry out education in an entirely different space without much preparation, planning, and in some cases, digital experience. Third, most of the traditional processes and evaluations that govern learning were minimally implemented and changed. Education was given the room to adapt to the prevailing circumstances. This pause gives us a very rare and possibly very short window of opportunity to recreate educational institutions. So how do we reconceptualize education? What should we teach? The what of learning has always been prescribed by governments, educational institutions, or bodies of authoritative individuals. It needs to be acknowledged that to thrive in a future globalized world, traditionally valued skills and knowledge will become less important and a new set of capabilities will become more dominant and essential. While the specifics vary, the general agreement is that repetition, pattern prediction and recognition, memorization, or any skills connected to collecting, storing, and retrieving information are in decline because of artificial intelligence and related technology. Instead, we should consider contemporary skills, 
which includes creativity, curiosity, critical thinking, entrepreneurship, collaboration, communication, growth mindset, global competence that are needed for tomorrow's world. <clears throat> How should we teach? Except for the more progressive and innovative uh, places of education, the how of learning has typically been directed by the teacher. So we could ask, do we need to teach all the time, given that so many online learning resources are already available? Learners can be more actively engaged in their own learning, making informed decisions regarding their own learning pathways. This generation of learners are more active and tech savvy. They access information instantly and have been doing so throughout their daily life. Schools should, could start by allowing students to negotiate part of their curriculum instead of requiring all students to learn the same content. With ubiquitous access to online resources and experts, students do not necessarily need teachers to continually and directly teach them. The teacher's primary responsibility then is no longer simply just instruction, which requires us to reconsider teacher education as well. Where and when? The where of learning has been defined as a classroom. COVID-19 changed one of the most important unwritten rules. All students must be in one location for education to take place. When students are not learning in classes, they are distributed in the community. They can interact with others through technology. This can have significant impact on learning activities and learning from experts anywhere. Thus, the where of learning changes from the classroom to the world. Furthermore, when learning goes online and students are not or do not need to be in schools, the learning time vastly expands beyond the traditional school time. They can learn asynchronously at any time. Equally important is that their learning time does not need to be synchronous or with students or even with that of the teacher. It is important to remember that the what, how, where, and when of learning discussed here are not new ideas. Many of us have been thinking about more innovative ways to deliver an education that is driven by students, that is more oriented toward purpose and meaning, and that is more global. Education will undoubtedly go through major changes in the next decade. Returning to our experiences of the past two years, you must acknowledge that the pandemic has inspired us to think of online education, not as a lesser version of face-to-face -face education, but as a different way to organize education. Digital tools enabled a new wave of students and educators in realizing advantages and opportunities. As educators and education leaders, we must pledge to use the lessons we have learned to continually adapt and evolve so that we can meet the needs of our future students and be prepared to help shepherd our communities to unpredictable future emergencies. I would like to end with a quote from Indian novelist and activist Arunzati Roy, who described the COVID-19 pandemic as a portal. She said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. There, this one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, our dead ideas, our dead rivers, and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Thank you. <laughs>